Typically, women have been more interested in erotic literature than pornography. The internet has changed women's consumption habits to watch more porn, but erotic literature and romance genres continue to be popular, with over 60,000 such novels sold in 2020, up from 36,000 a decade previously. They exist in a multitude of genres for a variety of readers, and many are self-published. How did we get here? Back in the 20th century before the internet, buying a sexy paperback or subscribing to the Harlequin Publishing Company was easier or preferred for many women versus going into a sex store and buying a dirty magazine or video. In this video, I want to explore the history of erotic literature by looking at the legacy of Zane, whose bold and brash books topped black bestsellers lists at the turn of the century during a mini sexual revolution in the black community, and Fifty Shades of Grey, which became one of the fastest selling books in the world during the coming of age of fourth wave feminism. We'll get a glimpse at how freaky humans have always been, I'm looking at you Anne Rice, and how erotica has been transgressive and controversial, and in doing so we'll add another fun capsule to the Let's Talk About Sex History collection. Speaking of, I think it's so cool that I've got to talk about all these amazing topics from the world of sex thanks to Beducated, including my most provocative videos, you know the ones that don't get monetized. If anybody understands the importance of watering your libido, indulging your fantasies, and gaining pleasure, it's Beducated. On their site of over 100 courses, there are thorough and inclusive guides to everything you've ever had a question about. To speak in the parlance of a PG-13 romance novel, there's tea on everything from massaging one's mound to giving a down there kiss. If you're interested in learning how to overcome a low libido, managing sexual trauma, exploring new types of sex, or even best ways to give a lap dance, Beducated wants to help. Let's say you're interested in learning about dating. There's a category for that. Are you curious about navigating non-monogamy ethically? Here's a hint. It's not fucking somebody from high school who you still have a crush on, you know, and they're married. But Beducated will tell you that in a much nicer way. When you click the link in my description box and use my code ELEXIS, you get 40% off the yearly pass for the rest of July. You can also invest in your love life and sexual pleasure for just $10 a month. Or you can give Beducated to someone else with a personalized gift card. If you aren't satisfied with Beducated, they offer a 14-day money-back guarantee. I really hope you give Beducated a try if you have unanswered questions about your sex life and you tell them I sent you. Now, let's get into the history. literature is as old as the first novels and plays of ancient Rome, Greece, and ancient Asia. From the Satyricon to Fanny Hill and 120 Days of Sodom and beyond, most surviving works were written by men and varied in their explicit nature. By the 20th century, when the scope of this video begins, paperbacks were a revolutionary and cheap form of entertainment, and hundreds of millions of them were distributed during World War II. A study found that the most popular of the armed services editions paperbacks distributed to American soldiers dealt frankly with sexual relations, regardless of tone, literary merit, and point of view, no matter whether the book is serious or humorous, romantically exciting, or drably pedestrian. From the late 1940s to the 1960s, there was a thriving lesbian pulp fiction genre. One writer explained to the New York Times in September 1965 that lesbianism was such a popular theme for pulp because the reader gets two immoral women for the price of one. Most of these books were written by men, but approximately 50 titles were written by women for women and were marked by scholar Yvonne Keller as pro-lesbian, explained writer Catherine V. Forrest, who compiled the 2005 anthology Lesbian Pulp Fiction. The books were like water in the desert. For lesbians living clandestinely in mid-20th century America, the books were a source of erotic pleasure and representation. A notable early erotica contributor was Cuban writer Anais Nin, who began writing naughty literature after reading French paperbacks in an apartment she rented with her 
husband in Paris. One by one, I read these books, which were completely new to me. I had never read erotic literature in America. They overwhelmed me. I was innocent before I read them, but by the time I had read them all, there was nothing I did not know about sexual exploits. I had my degree in erotic lore. She and other famous writers were solicited to write pornographic literature for a dollar a page for a private collector. Her stories eventually became posthumous collections Delta of Venus and Little Birds, published in the 1970s. These books would be of interest to the writer Susie Bright, the editor of On Our Backs, an erotica magazine for lesbians that got its name from the rad femme news journal Off Our Backs, which regularly published anti-porn views. The 70s, a period of second wave feminism, was still a weird time for women's sexuality, especially in brewing sex wars in which radical feminists saw most sex and expressions of eroticism as negative or as performances for the male gaze. For instance, it was common belief that women didn't have sexual fantasies and therefore didn't need erotic literature. And author Nancy Friday's books of interviews with women caused her to be explicitly labeled not a feminist by Miss Magazine in the 70s. For perspective, her first book, 1973's My Secret Garden, came out a year after The Joy of Sex, which was itself groundbreaking. Though Friday did not in fact identify as feminist, the implication by Miss was that she couldn't be an ally to women because she encouraged sexual fantasies and exploration. During the next decade, after the failures of two novels following Interview with a Vampire, Anne Rice published the Sleeping Beauty novels under a pseudonym, A.N. Rocolaire. I probably said that wrong. What, what does this say? Somebody tell me in the comments. While much of Rice's work to this point had elements of the erotic. The Sleeping Beauty trilogy was so sexual that her regular publisher, Knopf, considered it too obscene to publish. Rice said, I wrote the erotica because I couldn't find that kind of book in bookstores. I wanted to write not the kind of books where you'd mark the hot pages, but where every page would be hot. She added, I didn't put anything in those books that didn't turn me on. I didn't mean to act it out. I have no interest in acting out S&M. Never have. These erotic BDSM novels set in a medieval fantasy world played on the Sleeping Beauty fairy tale and carved out a loyal fan base. Rather than Sleeping Beauty being awoken by a prince with a kiss and whisked off to live happily ever after, the prince awakens her with sex and then imprisons her as a sex tribute. The books became so attached to BDSM culture that classified ads from the 90s reveal a bunch of singles looking for partners or hookups who had read the novels, and the books also became highly contested and banned. After a 12-year-old borrowed the second book in the series in 1996 from Columbus Metropolitan Library, her mom complained, and the books were banned for everybody. And people really liked those books because the library at the time owned 29 well-loved copies, okay? And five audio tape versions. Columbus, Ohio is freaky. I used to live there. When Anne Rice revealed herself to be the author of the Sleeping Beauty trilogy as early as 1990, there were murmurs about her bedroom proclivities. Her husband Stan defended her, saying, she's no more sadomasochistic than she's a vampire. In 1993, Rice scoffed at people who slammed her erotica, saying, women are entitled to our own porn, our own fantasies, our own sexuality. Women are out of the closet. This is the age of Hillary Clinton and Madonna. The Sleeping Beauty trilogy became a quartet with a fourth release in 2016, three years after she defended Paula Deen being exposed for using the N-word as her being a victim of lynch mob culture. Sorry, I couldn't resist spilling the tea. video on the coldest winter ever, Sister Soldier in urban literature. I charted the rise of black storytelling and independent self-publishing in the 90s. But now it's time for a deep dive on the novelist Zane, whose writing catalyzed a black erotic literature revolution. While there were black romance authors like Beverly Jenkins, writer of historical romances often set in the 19th century, whose innuendo-laden stories appealed to soft audiences, and the discussion of romance and sex and Terry McMillan's popular 90s contemporary novels there was no Zane. Shane Lee argued in the book Erotic Revolutionaries, Black Women, Sexuality, and Pop Culture that Zane arguably has more impact on sexual politics than any other figure in contemporary American culture. And 
I agree, definitely when it comes to the black community. While there were certainly tantalizing sex scenes that showcased a frank and direct style of talking about sex rather than flowery euphemisms in The Coldest Winter Ever, the main point of the story was a moral tale. It wasn't a romance story or meant to be erotica or meant to turn you on. And while movies featured more sex scenes than ever and rap music spoke frankly about sex in a continued tradition from blues and 1970s R&B, including the fantasies and lyrics of female MCs like Lil' Kim and Foxy Brown, Dean's writings tapped into a sexually repressed and curious market made up of middle-class black American women who were professional and or church-going. Women who liked to curl up with a good book at home. Women who concerned themselves with things like body count. Women who thought giving head was for freaks, not good women. So Christina Laferne Roberts was a mother of three, working part-time in Raleigh, North Carolina as a research assistant for her father, James Deotis Roberts, a well-known theologian from North Carolina who previously taught at Howard University. Christina herself had attended Howard for a degree in chemical engineering but never graduated. She claimed she had never read erotica before when she passed along a naughty story to three friends from AOL chat rooms in 1998. Yes, I said AOL. You remember that? Christina credited the story to Zane, which she says she either got from Billy Zane, who was fresh off of a Titanic press run, or Zane Gray, the author. The story she wrote quickly circulated beyond her circle, and the newly christened Zane started eroticanore.com to publish more stories before fans demanded a book in 1999. Various newspapers reported different prices, but the collection of 10 stories she printed and bound at Staples cost 10 to $13, and she sold over 1,000 copies copies of these books, selling them under her own company, Schreber Books International. So in 2000, her next self-publishing offering was the $22 Sex Chronicles, Shattering the Myth. It sold between 80,000 to 250,000 copies. Publishing companies began contacting her, trying to extend deals, but they also asked Zane to tone her work down. Apparently, mainstream publishing wasn't ready for her characters, like Sore or Deep Throat, or Exotic surrealism involving food seasoned with body secretions in a short story called Valley of the Freaks. Zane's books generated interest for a bunch of reasons. First, nobody knew who Zayn was. People weren't even sure about the author's gender and many people assumed it was a man. Secondly, many of Zane's central characters were professional and or respectable black women with underlying fantasies, representations that hadn't often been seen in media, if at all. Real life women who sometimes had no outlet for discussing sexual fantasies could feel titillated by Zane's characters. These were professionals, sorority women, churchgoers, the types of black women so often repressed by respectability politics into not masturbating, not seeking orgasms, or exploring their sexuality. When Zane came clean to her family about her secret profession, she recalled her mother saying, can you write something that the family could read to the people at church? And then Zane told her, believe it or not, they are reading it. The women that filled Zane's stories initiated sexual encounters, masturbated, enjoyed and admitted to performing oral sex, which is a big deal, demanded and received oral sex, which is even a bigger deal, rode dick, dabbled in anal sex or outright demanded it, had sex in public, and they sought orgasms. They were open about their pleasure and critical of their lovers' performances. If you've seen my videos on the histories of oral sex and masturbation, you know that both both activities have historically had negative connotations in the black community, especially for women. Said a character from the Sisters of Alpha Phi Fuck'em, there's no shame in our game. We are what we are, sexually uninhibited women that like to get fucked right. Remarked Shane Lee, this idea that love is not sex, sex is not love, is another recurring motif in Zane's works. The male characters in these books were often disposable or good for nothing more than sex and financial benefits. So while Lil' Kim was rapping about her dreams of fucking R&B niggas and comparing her sex skills to porn stars Janet Jack me and Heather Hunter bragging about the jewels and money she got in return to a diverse audience, kicking off the pussy rap trend that is blamed for modern women's dating standards, a clandestine middle-class daughter of a theologian encouraged respectable women to lean into their sexy fantasies while providing substance in books. She said later, 
I could just say, and then they had sex, and it would still be a complete storyline. That, to me, is the difference between erotica and pornography. But what set Zane's erotica apart from typical writing was its frankness. Essence Magazine editor Patrick Henry Bass acknowledged that sexuality had often had a place in black novels, but that it was over-romanticized or intellectualized, before citing a clear change after Terry McMillan's Waiting to Exhale. By 2004, the same year that Zane first allowed a publication to interview her or publish her photo, Streber Books International had 34 authors publishing 25 books a year. The next year, it was acquired by Simon & Schuster for a hefty sum, and the imprint published lesbian erotica like Purple Panties, and in 2014, former DC Mayor Marion Barry's biography. It's safe to say that super freaky and frank erotic literature was lucrative. Simon & Schuster enticed Zane into a multi-million dollar book deal and assured her that she didn't need to change a thing about her writing. It was reported that the 37-year-old suburban mom had eight books sell over 2.5 million copies in four years, and that she was beating out heavy hitters Toni Morrison and Eric Jerome Dickey on the lit list. Other erotic writers would overlap with the urban fiction genre and they would publish books and gain fan bases, but the anonymity of Zane as well as her storytelling made her the star. Zane stressed that her novels were works of fiction, nothing more than fantasies, even saying monogamy was the best type of relationship. Even still, Zane's works had an impact on her audience. Women would come to her book signings and break down, telling her they had awakened their sexual exploration. Explained then editor of Black Expressions, an online book club of over 400,000 members, she's like the Dr. Ruth of our time. Sex isn't openly discussed in most of our homes. To have an author come out and broach this, even in fiction, is a breakthrough for us. Other readers, inspired by the journey of a sex addict named Zoe and Addicted, revealed that they had sought treatment in therapy. Zane's popularity led to a sex manual titled Dear G-Spot, which instructed women to put their sexual pleasure first. Another recurring theme in Zane's works and advice were telling women to pick themselves. Described a 42-year-old librarian in Baltimore named Joy Williams, most of Zane's books deal with women who see the signs that something is wrong with the person they are with or the relationships that they're in, but they choose to overlook these problems because of the sex. The books aren't like romance novels with happily ever after endings. In her early 2000s, 2004 interviews, Zane emphasized her respectability, mentioning her husband and simple lifestyle, partly as a marketing tactic and partly as a buffer. In fact, she divorced her husband of two years and the father of her younger son after she went public, accusing him of being a thief and drug addict. He claimed in court that she is a famous author of pornographic material and has mothered three prior children from three different men out of wedlock and in which none of them are in their children's lives despite one of her children being dead. Zane obviously kept all of this out of the public eye. Zane books were ubiquitous when I was a teen. They were secretly passed around like dirty magazines and nearly every black woman's house I went to had at least one Zane publication somewhere on the premises. By 2015, when Zane was 48 years old, over a dozen of her novels had gotten onto the New York Times bestseller list, alongside names like Stephen King, and over five million copies had been sold. She was made the executive producer on her Cinemax show, Zane Sex Chronicles, and she had a sex toy line and a movie movie based on Addicted. The movie opened to 846 theaters in 2014 and made 17 million against a $5 million budget. This happened in the midst of the revelation that Zane owed the state of Maryland over $340,000 in back taxes, and financial trouble would follow Zane in the years to come, but her books still remain at the top of black erotica lists. Unfortunately, Zane's legacy would be overshadowed by Fifty Shades mania. Fifty Shades of Grey caused a bunch of controversy for incorporating BDSM and pushing the boundaries of consent. So now is a good time to remind you that Beducated has a popping key kink and BDSM category if you're feeling adventurous. I'm talking about everything from aftercare to wax play and shibari. But even more importantly, there's topics on communication and consent. If you want all the tea, click the link in my description box and use my code ELEXIS so you get 40% off the yearly pass for the rest of July. Or sign up for $10 a month. And there's no need to stress. There's a 14-day money-back guarantee. Go ahead and pause me right here if you want to. Go over to the link. I'll be waiting. I'll be here. 
generally uncontroversial, like I found no official negative press in my research, the same cannot be said for Fifty Shades. The novel series Fifty Shades of Grey was originally Twilight fan fiction by Erica Leonard James called Master of the Universe. Featuring Edward and Bella erotica, the fiction was taken down by a site for breaking the rules and later was reworked and self-published in Fifty Shades. The story involved a handsome billionaire sweeping up a young college student into a relationship featuring BDSM and lavish living. After selling well as a self-published title in June 2011, it was acquired by Vintage Books the next year. The redistributed book was an instant mega hit, selling 30 million copies in four months, and it will ultimately be translated into 52 languages in 150 million copies worldwide. The success was attributed to the large audience of women over 30 and their access to e-readers, causing media to speculate on the genre of mommy porn. Wrote David Gushy, I've had many of my female students tell me that this is like pornography that good Christian women feel comfortable having on their desk at work. It somehow crossed the line to socially acceptable. The book also exploded the world of self-publishing. There was real money to be made. In 2011, Bowker registered 148,424 printed self-published books and 87,201 ebooks. In 2017, the registered number of self-published books was more than a million, and one of them was my book, Angry Black Girl. Go check that out. Fifty Shades of Grey was credited with getting more women into BDSM, though this was problematic, especially when the movie came out in 2015 and made 81.7 million bucks its opening weekend. The critical reviews were bad, but the fan base was mostly satisfied. I didn't read the books, but I really enjoyed the movie and it was really good. Some say so good they wanted more. I think they did a real good job. I just think the sex scenes should have been a little longer. I'm not saying they should have been a little more like risque. Others a little underwhelmed. It was kind of cheesy but I mean what do you expect? Very few erotic novels have become widely distributed films and Fifty Shades of Grey Mania sparked so much discourse and controversy driving up demand that a bunch of copycat books follow with similar cover features or titles. But none could talk 50, whose champions and critics were equally passionate. The American Family Association president, Tim Wildman, said that the evil movie would have a corrosive effect on cultural views of what normative sexuality ought to be. Numerous BDSM practitioners and domestic violence advocates complained about Fifty Shades of Grey for conflating abuse with BDSM. Reported USA Today on the creation of the protest movement Fifty Shades of Abuse using the hashtag $50 not Fifty Shades, they're urging would-be moviegoers to donate $50 to local women's shelters instead of seeing the movie. Wrote Emma Green in 2015, as several experienced BDSM practitioners emphasized to me, there are healthy, ethical ways to consensually combine sex and pain. All of them require self-knowledge, communication skills, and emotional maturity in order to make the sex safe and mutually gratifying. The problem is that Fifty Shades casually associates hot sex with violence, but without any of this context. Other critics were worried about the lessons being imparted to teen girls who had access to it. And we're really concerned that because of its R rating that teenagers who are, you know, just coming into their sexuality are going to see this and it really portrays a violent sexuality. Fifty Shades is teaching girls that this kind of story reflects a normal, acceptable relationship where virgins are educated about sex from a male dominator, said Rosalind Wiseman, the author of the nonfiction book that inspired Mean Girls. Because many American teens miss out on a thorough sexual education that prioritizes knowledge of consent, it was stressed that teen girls reading Fifty Shades of Grey or watching the movie wouldn't be able to understand the line between fiction and fantasy, like with youth and pornography. But this speaks to a sexual education problem in this country. Fifty Shades also revived 1980 sex wars about BDSM, porn, and sex work, with Miriam Grossman writing, a psychologically healthy woman avoids pain. She wants to feel safe, respected, and cared for by a man she can trust. She dreams about wedding gowns, not handcuffs. Damn! We can't have fantasies! 
A 2008 paper found that 31 to 57 percent of women reported fantasies of being overpowered or raped, and of those, between 9 and 7 percent said it was a frequent or favorite fantasy. A 2009 study of 470 predominantly heterosexual college-age men and women found that both sexes preferred fantasies of being dominated by the opposite sex, rather than dominating others themselves. Both of these studies, and Rihanna's 2010 video for her hit s and were before the phenomenon of Fifty Shades of Grey, and yet the book came to be seen by critics as the cause for an uptick of non-vanilla sex, when in actuality it was probably just an outlet for people who were already interested. At the end of the series, Christian Grey gives up his BDSM predilections and is cured of his childhood traumas, which BDSM practitioners considered to be a demonization. Looking back, several forces led to Fifty Shades of Grey's popularity and backlash. First, the book debuted when rape culture was being brought into the national spotlight via incidents like the Yale rape chanting and the Steubenville High School rape case, both early catalysts for the Me Too movement. This was the era of fourth wave feminism, which emphasized empowerment and choice. Secondly, it was a world that had long had erotic literature in various degrees of literary power, but the ability to self-publish on a wide scale was new, colliding with e-readers to be purchased by women who were unsatisfied with their sexual lives, whether because of sexual repression or inadequate partners. The Fifty Shades of Grey mania was during a time when sex toy sales, classes, and blogs were on the uptick, something Bloomberg called Fifty Shades of Stimulus. In 2013, my ex-boyfriend introduced me to Kegel Balls, and I'm sure it was Fifty Shades related. And about those sex wars I mentioned earlier, the argument over the fantasy of sexual violence in E.L. James' series, which critics conflated with instruction, represented a bigger argument happening among feminists that positioned personal sexual choices, aka choice feminism, against radical feminism. Popular mainstream feminist thought was that anything a woman did was feminist, even if it was harmful or if there were deeper systemic issues that made multiple things true at once. There would be arguments about choice feminism and girl bosses and capitalist enterprise, watching and participating in pornography or sex work, and participating in things considered fodder for the male gaze, like posting a thirst trap or participating in YouTube beauty trends or plastic surgery. Said pissed off feminist Megan Tyler and Laura Tar in 2015 about the upcoming Fifty Shades movie. Indeed, much of the discussion today still hinges on individual choice, with the suggestion that if you choose to do something and enjoy it, it is therefore beyond critique. But our sexual choices are never made in a social and political vacuum. Not to sound like Carrie Bradshaw, the most vanilla sex writer of all time, but I couldn't help but wonder. Because Fifty Shades Mania was a manifestation of all these greater cultural elements and disputes during a very specific time, could Zane's novels have caused the same controversy and received the same worldwide distribution if they had been published in 2012? Or would they have been limited like most black literature continues to be? What do you think? According to Zane, who was interviewed by Courtney Pope for Refinery29 earlier this year, I was not the first person to write black erotica and I want to give credit where credit is due. What I did was take black erotica from the back of the bookstore to the front, which shocked even me. I think Zane existed at the perfect time. On one hand, her novels debuted during a formalization of black feminism in the hip hop generation. And on another, there were black women who didn't identify with feminism at all, who were enjoying a new sexual freedom that I'll be diving into in Lectual Does the 90s. Zane was in her 20s in this era. The internet and changing attitudes about sex and pop culture and black culture likely impacted her writing, and if not her writing, definitely the audience who made her a multi-millionaire. Shane Lee's assessment that she was one of the most impactful figures on modern black women's sexual politics is pretty astute. Perhaps that's why when I read Fifty Shades of Grey in college based on someone's recommendation, I thought it wasn't sexy at all and it wasn't for me. But different strokes for different folks. Erotic literature is important because people, especially women, should be allowed to explore their fantasies without judgment. Erotic literature doesn't exist in a vacuum, meaning misogyny and patriarchy will find a way in, but we, the readers, don't exist in a vacuum either. We can handle complicated characters and plots in our fiction, the same way we can handle knowing that real world people are complicated. Plus, like different kinds of music, movies, fashion styles, etc., there should be a variety of erotic literature, from the cheap and tawdry to the stuff I want to create in my spare time. Wait, 
Uh, did I just say that? I didn't say that. As sex positive and choice feminism seems to fall increasingly out of fashion with modern women, what does that mean for erotic literature and future fever pitches of the ongoing sex wars? Will there be another opening for a new brand of erotic literature? How will it be received? And lastly, will erotic literature stay this popular? That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this short and dirty tour through erotic literature. If you're a lover of erotic fiction, what are you into? Who are your favorite authors? share in the comments so I can know. Let me know. I hope you like this video and subscribe and thank you so much for watching.